Welcome, folks. My name is Stephen Macedo, and I'm current president of the American Society for Political and Legal Philosophy. We're delighted to have you here. If you're not a member, you don't know what you're missing. I urge you to follow Jim Fleming's email exhortations and fill this gap in your lives. Join, you won't be sorry. Before turning things over to Eric and Elizabeth, I just want to thank our outgoing officers, members of the ASPLP Council. First, Professor Yasmin Dawood of the University of Toronto's Faculties of Law and Political Science, and Professor Derek Darby of the Rutgers University Philosophy Department. Thank you both so much uh, for your assistance and sage advice over the years, and we look forward to your continued participation. And I want to welcome our incoming officers, Professor Anita Allen of the University of Pennsylvania's School of Law and Philosophy Department, and Professor Anna Stiltz of Princeton University's Politics Department and University Center for Human Values. And thanks also to Sarah Song and Tommy Shelby for their ongoing service on the council. Uh, in addition, at the end of tomorrow's session, I will be ousted as president after a rigged election. Not really, I just wanted to get your attention. We serve for one term each and I'll be delighted to hand over the reins to David Estland of Brown University's philosophy department. I know the organization will be in great shape and great hands. And finally, I wanna acknowledge the sustained and successful efforts of Jim Fleming of Boston University's Law School over many years as editor, then president, and now secretary treasurer. During my term as president, he's grown the organization, tripling the membership over the last couple of years and improved it in a host of ways. Thank you, Jim, for your ongoing dedication to legal and political philosophy uh, and to this organization. Now there's auto transcription available for those of you who wish to turn it on. I can't tell you how to do that, but I'm told that it's available. And now without further delay, I'll turn things over uh, to the organizers of this conference, uh, Eric Bierbaum of Harvard University and Professor Elizabeth Beaumont of UC Santa Cruz. Eric and Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you so much, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, our keynote lecture tonight is co-authored by Sigal Ben Parath, Amy Gutman, and Dennis Thompson. In the summer of 2020, when we began planning this conference, we discovered that these three authors had been working on a paper that was arrestingly topical. In fact, the very title was Civic Education in a Polarized Society. So we were really delighted when they agreed um, not to steal our thunder, but instead to help amplify it um, by providing um, this address and contributing to the volume. And I'm thrilled to be introducing one of these authors, Sigal Ben Parath, who is professor at the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also an affiliated member of the political science and philosophy departments at Penn and a, an executive committee member of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy, among many other roles and accolades. Most importantly for this gathering, uh, Ben Parath is a leading voice on both the theory and the practice of civic education in schools and colleges um, and their relationship to democracy. She has five excellent books examining crucial aspects of these questions, including recent work on the roles of free speech and civic dialogue on campuses. And I'll now hand my introductory baton over to Eric Bierbaum. Thank you, Liz, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this paper is the product of equal co-authorship, uh, and while it is, uh, Amy Gutman sends her regrets that she's not able to present tonight when she was nominated to serve as an ambassador to the US and Germany this summer, um, and as she prepares for her Senate hearing, which we all hope will be a profound deliberative moment. Um, you all know that Professor Gutman has served as the eighth president of the University of Penn since 2004 the longest in the university's history, and her, 2000, her 1987 book, Democratic Education, helped rejuvenate interest in the intersection of education and democracy, and it very much remains a classic. Her frequent co-author, Dennis F. Thompson, is Alfred North Whitehead Professor of Political Philosophy in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Government Emeritus at Harvard. Dennis has built so many institutions, from serving as the founding director of the Edmund J. Soffer Center for Ethics at Harvard, to proposing what became the Office of Congressional Ethics in 2008. His many books, which range from justice in elections to the spirit and practice of compromise to ethics in Congress, feel more urgent morally and politically today than ever. And we would ask uh, uh, during the keynote, which will go on for about 45 minutes, if you submit, uh, it doesn't have to be a whole question, uh, but uh, kind of telegraphing to Liz and I uh, the direction of your question, and we'll start to then collect them uh, and then we'll ask you uh, to, uh, to speak your question, although you won't be displayed uh, with video, 
uh, we want your voices to be heard. Um, so that will be done through the Q&A tab. Uh, and without further ado, I turn it over to Seagal and Dennis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I don't see, um, can you see me at this point? We sure can, you, you look great, Dennis. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm in the, uh, up in the North Woods uh, in New Hampshire. And so the lighting is not exactly what we would have hoped for, but uh, if you can see me, uh, we should be all right. Um, thank you for the introduction. And um, I would just say, we're sorry that Amy can't be here, but we want to emphasize what you already alluded to, that despite all of her other commitments, she was fully engaged in the writing of this paper. She contributed at least as much as Seagal and I did. So yeah, it is a jointly authored paper. What we're presenting is a briefer version of uh, a longer paper but we will confine ourselves to the 45 minutes that uh, Eric gave us and Seagal and I'll split it in half. Uh, as Elizabeth said, our working title was Civic Education in a Polarized Society uh, in the spirit of this conference. We, um, but uh, I, I think we would now wanna call it something more specific to give you an idea of what we're talking about competition and cooperation in civic education. So I begin. we begin with a lament. As many commentators and commissions and educators have observed, civic education in the nation's public schools has suffered neglect in recent years. In the 1960s, by no means a golden age, uh, students took uh, usually three civics courses in high school. Today, many states don't require any civic education at all, and those that do require no more than one course, often just a half a course. Now, there is some sign of renewal, uh, and we'll later mention, um, particularly in, uh, when Seagal speaks, some examples of renewal. But whether or not the decline is persisting, it's fair to say that civic education today gets less attention than it should in a healthy democracy. It's subject to not so benign neglect. There are a number of uh, conspicuous sources for this neglect. Um, civic education usually does not have a place on the standardized tests that have come to dominate teaching. It often raises controversial issues that many teachers may want to avoid. It's competing for attention with a, in a crowded curriculum with new subjects like computer science and personal finance. But there is another, I think, less appreciated source of neglect, a divergence between the ostensible aim of most civic courses and the polarized state of American politics. The aim emphasizes cooperation, while the politics manifests competition. Even when civic education focuses on facts, its aim is to encourage a more cooperative politics. So in a, appreciating the implications of this divergence between the aim and the state of politics, we wanna suggest, can guide efforts to strengthen civic education. In civic education, the gap between what many educators seek to teach and how politics is practiced, that gap has long existed. But as hyper-partisanship has increased in recent days, the gap has become even more striking. So the question we address is how should we deal with this gap between what civic educators are asked to teach and what political citizens practice? One approach, one that emphasizes uh, competition would be more useful in this polarized politics of our time. It would help teach students how to be more effective in fighting for their own causes 
students would be taught the skills of competing, how to use rhetoric that's more typical in campaigns and protest movements, strategies that are more appropriate for zero sum politics, debates that are more designed to sharpen and highlight differences, and generally techniques that are more effective in mobilizing the like-minded to prepare students to function effectively in a polarized and unequal society, we would aim to cultivate school skills and attitudes more suitable for competing based on opposing interests than for cooperating in search of common ground or compromise across divides. A competitive approach should also be able to help civic education gain wider support as it's more easily recognized as practical. The skills it teaches are directly useful to the lives the students are actually experiencing or at least observing. But we also think that an approach that emphasizes competition is incomplete. To adopt a competitive approach exclusively would ignore the potential for improvement in civic discourse, civic engagement and alliances for the common good. A second approach, teaching to the ideals of cooperation, we think is critically important. Improvements in the direction of creating a more just society will rebound to the greatest benefits of those who are disadvantaged and will do the most in the long term to close the civic empowerment gap. Giving in to the realities of polarized politics and relentless competition risks widening the civic empowerment gap by giving up on civic education, which is designed to uh, create and sustain a more just society. On this approach, we would teach rhetoric that is mutually respectful, strategies for finding common ground, dialogue that bridges differences, techniques that bring opponents together, and generally attitudes suitable for cooperating rather than competing. As for the need for wider public support, we should not abandon a cooperative approach just because it's not an easy sell. This contrast I've drawn, uh, which will shape a, a lot of what we say here today, uh, points to a fundamental dilemma of civic education in a polarized society. If the dilemma goes as follows. If we teach only co cooperation, we do not prepare students for the democratic politics they will actually face. We fail to give students the skills and knowledge they need for actual citizenship. So we should teach for competition. If we teach only competition, we reproduce and reinforce the polarized politics that prevails in our society. We fail to realize the potential of democratic citizenship for all. So we should educate for cooperation. The dilemma can be overcome, we argue, um, by a, what we call a broader understanding of civic, civic education, one that promotes teaching both competition and cooperation. Teaching the basic facts of civics, constitution and history is of course necessary, but we here are proposing a broader understanding that goes beyond those pursuits and focuses more on skills and attitudes than on content. This broader understanding connects competition and cooperation just as they should be connected in a properly functioning democracy. Also, this broader understanding should be able to provide an effective response to the civic empowerment gap. Learning to both compete and cooperate, we think, can help motivate students with different levels of training in civics to take steps to ensure that they're included in the civic sphere. So, as in most domains, in many domains of education, civic education needs to have one foot planted firmly in the reality of how democracy functions now, and another foot in the aspirational future in which democracy functions better. 
And to that end, we grasp both horns of the dilemma. We defend a civic education that teaches both competition and cooperation. So to be a little more um, analytic, what do we mean by competition and cooperation and how do we combine them? Competition, as we understand it, and this should be very familiar, is an activity in which participants following agreed upon rules try to establish relative advantage over others who are trying to do the same. Democratic politics is replete with competition, most conspicuously between rival parties and candidates for public office. The primary aim of competition is, is to win. But in civic education, we would insist that how one wins and how one loses, for that matter, is critical. The competition that students learn should be fair, governed by rules that do not favor one side or the other. Students should learn to observe the spirit of the rules, which prevent violence, fraud, and deceit. They should not demonize their opponents or take unreasonable advantage of them and should accept the results of competition, even in defeat. A lesson that is worth learning again. All of these are valuable preconditions for any minimally acceptable democratic process. Most students, we think, can draw on their experience in competitive sports and other similar activities they probably have an intuitive sense of the difference between fair competition with its equitable contestation and no holds barred competition with its dirty tricks and below the belt tactics. The difference can be further explored through explicit discussion in the classroom, both before and after the competitive exercise. In this way, I would note uh, competition, though it, we portrayed it as reflective of the realities of democratic politics in general, what I've just been saying shows that it has an ethical dimension. Fair competition is itself an ideal, but it falls short of the full-blown ideal of cooperation that civic education should also seek to promote. While competitors win try to win against their opponents. The cooperators uh, try to win over their opponents to pursue a common purpose. Cooperation is an activity in which participants work together toward the same end. The goal is a collective good shared by all rather than only particular goods allocated individually. In a democracy where sharp disagreements are to be expected, cooperation is necessary and desirable. It's necessary to meet, uh, to enact any laws and desirable to make the laws legitimate. While the debate is the typical competitive exercise, uh, the collaborative project is the characteristic cooperative activity. Students learn to cooperate by engaging in activities that require them not to prioritize personal preferences that may conflict with those of others. Uh, it requires them to seek a compromise, the classic compromise, where all sides gain something more for their own positions by ceding something they value to others, is a cooperative activity that actually turns competition into cooperation. The results of cooperative activities like those of a classic compromise are often different from what each would have preferred to start with and therefore is not simply the sum of the initial preferences. Both sides may have to sacrifice something, each values. But if the activity is carried out properly, both sides can see that the result is better than the absence of agreement. Now, it's true that competition requires some minimal form of cooperation. If a contest takes place, for example, between teams, the members have to be able to work together to develop their strategies 
assign roles each should play and coordinate their interactions. Both teams need to agree on rules and mechanisms to resolve disagreements. But all this internal cooperation, valuable though it is, place, takes place in a context where the main aim is to defeat opponents, not to collaborate with them. Learning to cooperate with teammates is based on a different goal, a different skill set than learning to cooperate with rivals. So, um, by way of summary, in simple terms, educating for competition means teaching the skills and attitudes useful for winning in the face of disagreement. And educating for cooperation means, means teaching skills and attitudes useful for collaborating in face of disagreement. More specifically, both require the ability to spot weaknesses in an opponent's position, but in competition, the students identify weaknesses so that they can exploit them. Whereas in cooperation, students identify the weaknesses so that they can compensate for them. Both require the ability to recognize differences, but in competition, it is for the purpose of sharpening the differences, whereas in cooperation for the purposes of overcoming them. Both require a will to succeed, but in competition, the will is applied to defeat opponents, whereas in cooperation, it is applied to enlist opponents in a common cause. Both require a mutual regard that supports an ongoing peaceful engagement, but in competition, the regard takes the form of an acknowledgement of a worthy opponent whereas in cooperation, it's a respect for those with whom one shares a common purpose. And I want to take, before turning it over to Seagal, a very brief uh, point of, that some of you may be wondering about. The contrast between competition and cooperation has some affinities with the distinction between aggregative and deliberative theories of democracy. Uh, you may have expected me to come down more on the side of deliberative democracy, but for this purpose, I uh, wanna say that neither teaching for competition nor teaching for cooperation requires a full, adopting a full-blown theory of democracy. In fact, it's important we make the general point to formulate goals of civic education that can stand independently of any particular comprehensive theory of democracy, because democratic citizens can reasonably disagree about which theory is correct. An important aim of civic education is to prepare students to engage with manifestations of that disagreement. So that means that civic education cannot settle in advance the question that Democrat, which democratic theory is correct. Nevertheless, the civic education we're proposing assumes a set of democratic values or principles that are integral to any, accept, any acceptable theory of democracy, specifically on any acceptable view of democracy in a polarized society both competition and cooperation are necessary and desirable for many of the reasons we've already described. Competition and cooperation are themselves value-laden. The values they assume, such as fair play and mutual respect, are the basic norms that any acceptable democracy, even in a polarized society, needs to endorse. So that's what we think about that's what we mean by competition and cooperation. And now the question is, how can they be taught together? And for that, I turn over this uh, event to Seagal. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, thank you, Liz and Eric, for the invitation. I'll just continue right through with, um, uh, with uh, the conversation about the paper. Um, Competition and cooperation can be taught together by introducing them alternately. The key to achieving this is teaching students how to step in and out of the competitive and cooperative roles. To see what this means, consider this illustrative scenario. 
a class would first cooperatively decide on what controversial issues to discuss. The teacher would divide the class into teams which would engage in a debate on the issue designed to be a competitive exercise. After the debate, students would step out of their competitive roles and adopt a cooperative perspective to assess whether the debate was conducted fairly. And finally, they would try cooperatively to reach a collective decision on the issues that were the subject of the debate. If, as would be likely, some students dissent from the collective decision, the class could discuss the value of dissent, how majority and minority might work together on related issues, and how majority and minority might change over time. Now, the point of introducing this scenario is not to suggest that it should be carried out in full in any actual classroom, but rather to show the teaching competition and cooperation depends on students moving back and forth between engaging in each. Students learn more about competition by cooperatively reflecting on its strengths and weaknesses and more by about cooperation by contrasting it with the experience of competition. By teaching competition, we bring out the difficulties of polarized politics, which the students may have experienced uh, in some form already. And by then teaching cooperation, we try to see how it can be overcome. Neither alone is sufficient. Competition without cooperation may engage students. And we do know that uh, competition tends to be more engaging in the classroom and also outside of it. But competition without cooperation leaves the polarization in place. And cooperation without competition uh, is less engaging and it conceals the seriousness of the problem of polarization. A central concept in teaching the alternation of competition and cooperation is compromise, about which my co-authors have written before. Compromise is a bridge between the two, between the two concepts that illustrates their shared centrality in democratic politics. While compromise requires cooperative skills and attitudes, it also relies on a competitive attitude in order to get the most for one side. Alternating competition and cooperation can help students engage with each other in their classrooms, which can lead to an increased sense of efficacy and as a result, greater political participation, both of which are really key goals of civic education of any form and surely uh, the form that we are discussing. The key feature of this scenario that I just used to illustrate, the alternation of competition and cooperation, can be found in more and less nascent forms in several innovative curricula in the classroom, as well as outside of it. And the problem that, the, sorry, the program that comes uh, closest to the approach we advocate is the legislative semester an innovative curriculum that allows teachers to alternate competition and cooperation in the classroom. And uh, it may sound familiar to some of you from uh, Diana Hess and Paula McAvoy's uh, book, uh, The Political Classroom, uh, to which we owe a debt of gratitude for uh, various aspects of this work, uh, including the introduction of this curriculum. Uh, we benefited from their uh, work in this book and uh, their work on civic. And also uh, Diana has, has put us in touch with uh, the school that I'm going to describe next. Um, so we focus on for the next few minutes on talking about the way that this curriculum is taught in a suburban school in the Midwest, which we call Oak Hill High. And uh, I conducted interviews with their faculty and we conducted related research um, during this past summer. The school uses a simulation of the legislative process that takes place over a semester. The students self-identify by party Democratic, Republican, or Independent. 
and elect a speaker as well as minority and majority leaders. Each class chooses a topic on which to legislate and small teams of st students draft bills on the topic. Following parliamentary procedure, they formulate, amend, and vote on bills in a process simulating a legislative committee. The leaders then choose which bills to bring to a debate and vote in the full assembly. Older students also serve as lobbyists offering or withholding monetary donations from legislators whose bills they wish to promote or defeat. The program teaches both competition and cooperation. It encourages competition between parties as well as among teams and interest groups that advance specific bills. It also teaches cooperation, principally in the committees where students form alliances across party lines and propose amendments that might persuade independents and members of the opposing party to support a bill. Some progressive students, for example, strongly advocated for a bill to enfranchise undocumented residents. Some of these students were themselves undocumented, which served to underscore the high stakes of their competitive advocacy, even in a simulation. The bill received initially only modest support, but after an amendment that limited participation to local rather than national elections, the bill gained broader support and moved forward to the assembly. The compromise illustrated cooperation in action, turning competition into cooperation. And one teacher reported that in action on more contentious issues, such as this example on uh, immigration, there are often five to 10 kids, this is a quote, there are often five to 10 kids who cross party lines and help write a more moderate bill. In the past, she reports, we did not let kids cross party lines and now they can move by policy preference, which made the class way more cooperative. Teachers report that the class is effective for learning about how government or at least the legislative branch actually operates. More important for our purposes, students learn the skills and attitudes of both competition and cooperation. At the same time, there are pitfalls that need to be guarded against in legislative simulations. Even accepting the fact that partisanship is an endemic and valuable part of democracy, students may become hyperpartisan in ways that can reinforce polarization and inhibit cooperation. One teacher that we interviewed worried that the emphasis on competition comes at the expense of cooperation. It's a competitive system, she said, and some win and some lose. It's winner takes all. Teaching the kids to live within the system that allows only some to win. It teaches kids that this is the main or only way to do democracy, combative, two-sided. Being on the opposite side of your friends, the other tribe, so she's reflecting on how difficult it is for some children. Ideally, a simulation would strike a balance between competition and cooperation and support compromise to enact both. Another way the legislative semester falls short is the relative lack of discussion on the, on the process itself, especially after it has concluded. For the purpose of teaching competition and cooperation, more explicit reflection on the process itself can enrich the lessons the students learn. Part of that reflection may include discussion of how compromise enables both sides to reach agreement that makes everyone better off and how the majority might work with the minority in pursuing future projects. And I just note that some uh, teachers recognize that and they're looking to extend the semester into a year long legislative process. A legislative semester and other forms of civic education are not likely to be successful unless students are exposed to civics in other classes earlier in their education. Middle schools can also productively offer a civics education that incorporates both competition and cooperation. And this is ex exemplified in the um, eighth grade civics curriculum that was developed by the Democracy Knowledge Project at the 
Edmond J. Suffer Ethics Center and by our colleague, Daniel Ellen, um, and is currently um, uh, in effect in many Massachusetts districts. Another potential site for civic education can be found in extracurricular activities beyond the classroom. And in the paper, we offer various examples of, of this option, but here I'll just mention one, which is the ethics bowl, uh, about which I have learned from some of my students who are in the audience. The ethics bowl is an extracurricular activity that teaches competition and cooperation in a distinctive way. The National High School Ethics Bowl and the Regional Ethics Bowl, it supports, are in the words of the organizer, competitive yet collaborative events in which students discuss real life ethical issues. The bowls, both the high school one uh, and the college one, focus on a wide variety of ethical issues, all involving social issues of significance for civic life and policy making. Teams take turns presenting their analyses of challenging ethical dilemmas and then respond to questions from other teams and the judges who are generally experts in ethics but are sometimes well-prepared students themselves. The ethics bowl is distinct from a debate in which students are assigned opposing views. Instead, according to the organizers of ethics bowl, students defend whichever position they think is correct provide each other with constructive criticism and win by demonstrating that they have thought rigorously and systematically about the cases and engage respectfully and supportively with all participants. And I'm happy to talk about ethics bowl more if people are interested. A form of civic education that moves beyond the school still in the spirit of alternating competition and cooperation goes by the general name of action civics. In contrast to the more common knowledge-based civic education, Action Civics six, seeks to teach political engagement through taking action on local issues that students care about. According to the National Action Civics Collaborative, Action Civics is designed to create an engage, this is a quote, an engaged citizenry capable of effective participation in the political process in their communities and in the larger society. Students engage in cycles of research, action, and reflection, partially mirroring the alterations, uh, alternation scenario described above or a few minutes ago. Students learn how to collaborate with one another in the process of competing for the attention of community leaders. They then stand back and reflect on their successes and failures. Action Civics makes room for both competition and cooperation and for opportunities to reflect on each. It might do so even more effectively when students are encouraged to tackle controversial political issues directly. Many of these programs, many of the action civics programs that uh, are currently in effect in schools tend to be apolitical to their detriment. So they look for topics that would not uh, uh, become too heated in discussion. But action civics as it stands offer an important model in the way it encourages students to do background research, compete and collaborate together to present their positions to political leaders and then reflect on ways um, uh, on what they have done and the ways in which they succeeded or failed. So in conclusion, uh, in this paper, we explore the tension between teaching to the ideals of civic education and teaching to the realities of political life. The tension creates what we call the dilemma of civic education. Should civic education teach the skills of cooperation as the ideals or aspiration prescribes, or should it teach the skills for competition as the realities dictate? and particularly in a polarized time. We have argued that it can and should do both. Adding a competitive dimension to civic education may increase its chances to receive higher priority in the curriculum than it has done in the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sigal and Dennis. And in this Q&A session, we're gonna seize the horn of cooperation and not competition. Um, we have plenty of space for everyone to ask their questions. And the first person to ask will be Michael Blake. 
uh, and we're going to unmute you um, now, just finding you in that list. If um, let's see where you are, Michael. Okay. There we go. Hi. Okay, cool. Lovely. Um, so I have a, a question that might be either very simple or potentially have something more to it, which is the extent to which we already do something very much like this in teaching more non-academic subjects, including sports because it seems there that we actually do give people the expectation both that they will be vigorous competitors and that they will cooperate, especially in the maintenance of certain norms and values that are expected to be shared in common. And in fact, I, I, I think this might be one way in which your view is even more right than it was presented as because we, we finally have a hockey team here in Seattle now, which I'm very happy about. And one of the things you notice is that during training camp, all of the players are literally beating the snot out of each other. And then they turn around and they have to fight together against other teams. And in fact, the fact that you're going to have to rely on people later to protect your body means that you tend not to cross certain lines in competition. So I think there would be something to say, not simply that you need to teach both cooperation and competition, but that teaching them in a certain sequence, could it teach people the value of competing in a way that maintains certain forms of respect for the normative structures that underlie the game? So I think the basic thrust of what I'm saying is, is there anything to be learned here from other people who have had to balance these two values uh, apart from those who have looked at civics? Very interesting point, Michael. Uh, and the I think the answer, short answer is yes, there is something to be learned. Uh, we alluded briefly to the sports as, sports as a um, possible source of, of inspiration. Uh, but, I, and, and I think the way you described it quite um, eloquently, the, uh, what the lessons one could learn in, in, in sports conducted properly are very uh, relevant to civic education. However, I would want to emphasize a point which I passed, which we passed over rather briefly, that uh, the kind competition is an ideal of a sorts, but, uh, but even, even as it's uh, presented in a, in sports, it's still in the context of trying to beat the other side, not beat them up, as you mentioned, but, uh, but to win. And that there's an element of cooperation that's missing, even though there is some cooperation, there's an element of it that's missing, uh, that's captured by the ideal of cooperation that I think sports doesn't completely, sports don't completely uh, exemplify. Seagal? Yeah, I agree with, with all of that. And it's a very helpful reminder, Michael, that, um, that you know, these, of course, are uh, principles or ideals that are uh, available to us in other uh, uh, aspects of our educational lives and other aspects of our social lives more broadly. But I would also note that I think it's very important in the approach that we are advocating for and in teaching civics more generally, that the um, connection to politics is intentional and explicit, right? So we are not simply talking about teaching competition and cooperation as generalized skills. We are talking about teaching them within the political context. And I think, this is something that schools for, for you know, uh, often uh, understandable reasons may shy away from doing, but I think it really does, uh, it, it really is necessary if we are going to reap the, the benefits that we discussed of uh, this type of more engaged civic education. So, uh, right, so it's, so, so the general skills are important, 
but then uh, clearly and explicitly applying them into the civic political sphere uh, is necessary, especially in a polarized context. Thank you. Elizabeth, you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> it was bound to happen. Next, we have a question from Colin McLeod. Uh, thanks, Dennis and Segal. Very interesting. I was um, maybe a little skeptical that your proposal could be so neatly detached from a commitment to either a deliberative or aggregative conception of democracy. The common commitment to the ground rules in which political competition takes place and what is effective competitive strategy will be informed by what we think those rules ought to be, and that's going to be informed by our conception of democracy, right? Uh, so it seems like some effective competitive strategies uh, that are routinely deployed under current political circumstances um, uh, would be problematic under certain understandings of a more deliberative conception, right? So um, sophistry, uh, uh, routine evasions to uh, questions, um, uh, refusal to debate. I was once asked to uh, uh, moderate an all candidates debate in my writing. Um, the liberal candidate, the incumbent, decided that it was politically advantageous not to participate, so she didn't. That was probably a wise competitive strategy, but not one that was in keeping with the sort of democratic norms one would hope in a fair competition aimed at exchanging reasons to vote, right? However, not against the rules, <laughs> right? And so it seems to me the, 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 the competitive strategies, for instance, that you would accept as um, ones that should be taught and ones that should not be taught uh, will be um, dependent on your background conception of democracy. So you can't entirely be neutral with respect to these the aggregative and deliberative conceptions, or so I worry. Yeah, that uh, it's a good point. I, 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 and I think uh, we want to concede that the conceptions of democracy uh, aggregative or deliberative will actually and should influence how one um, teaches the uh, competition and cooperation uh, process. But what we wanted to insist on is that it's possible, uh, e even though the, the, it will be informed by and shape and detail uh, competition and cooperation, the, the conceptions will. Uh, it's possible to adopt our framework of competition and cooperation in general terms without signing up for a deliberative or uh, competitive theory of democracy. Uh, we're gonna group uh, two interrelated questions uh, from Lucas Swain and from John R. And we would ask everyone to be uh, brief as any deliberative Democrat uh, is, is expert at. Sure, uh, thank you, uh, Eric. That's very sardonic. And thank you both uh, Sigal and Dennis for the great talk. I just have a quick question about this competition with cooperation model and how you might see it implemented even allowing for uh, fairly broad parameters in its reasonable implementation and accounting for some indeterminacy and so forth. There is a question about which values may rightly or reasonably be promoted in such a model. Some of these values that we have here in America go back to the common school. I'm thinking of self-reliance and hard work and so on. And those values, of course, are a little controversial these days. And there's a question whether to promote them or to endorse them in schooling and, and in the kind of schooling you uh, envision. And then relatedly, there's the matter of grading and whether to grade students in this sort of model you envision. And grading's even more controversial now, of course, both in itself, whether to give grades, and if so, how to give them, 
And then in particular here, whether to grade students at all based on their participation or their effort in class and so forth, which really um, you know, brings into question, I guess, some of these old time common school values and, and so on. So if you have any thoughts on, on that, I'd uh, be interested to hear them. Okay, can I speak now? Yes, John, you can, we can hear you. Uh, uh, it's John R. Wallach, actually. Um, so my question is for both Seagal Ben Porath and Dennis Thompson. Thank you for your stimulating and useful paper. My question is the following. To what extent and how are co cooperation and competition dependent or independent ideas? We know that it's often useful to separate procedure and substance, but we also know that they're interrelated. So how can uh, the exercise you recommend avoid being unduly artificial for the purposes of civic education. Um, I know that uh, the design is for high schools and high schools are supposed to be relatively immune from politics on the outside, but we know that uh, actually that no longer is the case or it is no longer the case in various areas. So I wondered uh, what your thoughts are on using the model you know, in this uh, context where uh, it's a matter of uh, polarized society, but also uh, around certain um, convictions. Thank you. So I, I can uh, give it a try. Uh, I think, so I agree that a lot of these issues are interrelated, but I would note that um, this is uh, surely not an effort that is going to resolve all of the issues that uh, were just now raised um, uh, in and of itself. I think uh, some of the attitudes that we are looking to uh, cultivate or support uh, through the introduction of a program such as this one or the various curricula that we've mentioned uh, can really support the development of some desirable, I don't know, attitudes or character traits or virtues, if you prefer, such as self-reliance, et cetera. So some political um, attitudes uh, that people, you know, that certain people might see as desirable can potentially be the result of, um, a, of such an intervention. Um, but I would actually think that, um, uh, the effort here is more modest in terms of its um, soul craft, uh, you know, the project of soul craft, right? It's really uh, more um, uh, focus on the habits that students might develop in um, a supporting uh, a, a, a procedural or a process uh, that is... Um, uh, conducive to uh, a more desirable form of political action. Um, I want to also make a quick comment about grading that um, uh, that was mentioned by Lucas. Uh, some places where this project is, where the legislative semester, for example, is enacted, and surely um, every place where ethics bowl or the other extracurricular efforts are introduced, are making an effort to be both inclusive and um, uh, use uh, other forms of grading that are less um, uh, hierarchical, right? So where students are allowed to really um, uh, be assessed by their efforts or by their participation or other forms, that, other forms of grading that are more formative. And so uh, my sense is that really uh, the focus here is on habits of cooperation that allow some form of um, a common school type uh, uh, attitudes to evolve. Uh, and while uh, uh, obviously, as John was saying, uh, uh, schools today are overtly uh, politicized by uh, various political actors, uh, something that's not brand new, but is clearly very striking today. Uh, I don't think schools can avoid uh, taking on uh, politics uh, in its appropriate form 
as part of the subjects that are being addressed in schools, but Dennis might have uh, another angle on that from what it looks. Uh, no, I agree with what you just said. Uh, I think that one of the reasons we pose this dilemma is that uh, the actual politics that we referred to in a polarized society are very much present in the schools that the students themselves are ob observing or experiencing. So they know what goes on in this, some of them anyhow, what goes on in the school boards, which is in these days not all is, can be quite ugly. And uh, it's polarized politics carried beyond the kind of competition that we would want to favor. Uh, just a, a brief comment, if I took John uh, Wallach's uh, initial point, which was that competition and cooperation are interdependent uh, more than we, we set them up as kind of opposed uh, in order to make an analytic point, and they are opposed in, the, in that they uh, require different uh, virtues, different attitudes and skills, but they also interact. They are interdependent. So uh, the way you, that's one reason we argue for an alteration in the uh, pedagogy. Uh, teaching about competition will affect the way you think about cooperation, teaching about cooperation will affect the kind of competition that you think is acceptable or learn to be acceptable. So um, it's a good point that these are interconnected, I think, uh, more than you might think from our initial statement of the dilemma. Great, thank you. We're gonna group three questions now. We're gonna start with Jennifer Morton and then Min Lee and then Myra Lev Levinson. Okay, great, thanks. Can you hear me? Awesome. Um, this is a great paper and I really like the tension, uh, you know, between kind of competition and cooperation and the examples that you brought up. I thought those were lovely. I am a little worried about though, whether um, we really need the competition soul crafting in some ways, uh, because I think students these days encounter so much of that already in the educational institutions they're in and just, uh, you know, when they go out into the labor market um, and in other domains. And so you might think that actually, given how much uh, competition is part of the system in ways that pit people against each other. And, you know, here I think of what he did saying's paper on kind of the kind of estrangement that it might lead to that, that you really kind of have to go hard in the other direction, right? That really what you should be doing is trying to create a space with um, less competition and where competition is not the way through which people um, you know, students are resolving uh, conflicts or are working together because they will inevitably encounter, right, these competitive institutions that are going to have an effect on their dispositions. And so you might think, actually, what we should be doing is sort of um, trying to resist that uh, as much as we can because it's kind of inevitable that they will encounter it uh, later. Oh, thank you, uh, Dennis Segal and Amy for your superb presentation. And I wanted to ask a question about whether both the um, cooperative and the competitive aspects of civic education are needed in order to overcome and to mitigate racial and economic disparities faced by minorities. So this in a way uh, might help you answer Jennifer's question. So on the one hand, cooperation, uh, com competition seems to be necessary in order for minorities to be able to successfully oppress and defend their interests. So I have in mind some recent research that was published in the American Political Science Review by Brockman and others, which indicated that um, representatives systematically um, mis overestimate how conservative their constituents are because conservatives are much more likely to, and people in the majority race are much more likely to contact their representatives. So if minorities and others knew how to contact their representatives and engage in other uh, ways civically, that could help to narrow what you call the civic empowerment gap so that they could successfully defend their interests. 
But on the other hand, it seems like cooperation is also needed because as Martin Luther King said in a famous speech, we cannot march alone. By which I think he meant that um, minorities are oftentimes numerically small. So in order for them to become electoral majorities and to be politically successful, other people, other citizens have to act in solidarity with them. And that requires a spirit of uh, cooperation, which civic education also needs to teach. Hi, this is Miura. Um, I really enjoyed uh, listening to this paper. Um, I want to go back actually to the conceptual distinction because I, like the practical uh, recommendations seem great to me. Yes, ethic bowl, I really like the design of ethics bowl. The legislative semester sounds great. I'm, as you know, I'm a fan of action civics. I like the democratic knowledge project. Like all of these are, are really good things, right? Um, and so um, as a practical matter, I'm totally on board. Um, but as a conceptual matter, I'm just a little perplexed, partly because, uh, at least in Dennis's part of the paper, and even then as you took over Seagull, it seemed as if you were framing um, uh, competition and cooperation as being uh, sort of this binary choice that you make ahead of time, sort of what way am I going to engage? And then you, you know, learn and adopt and practice those modes of engagement. But I just don't think that that's the way the world works. Um, like, I think that you have some aim, uh, right? There's some good you want to realize in the world. Um, and if you can achieve it through cooperation, great. Um, but then sometimes, you know, it turns out that you have to compete. Now that's not true for all things because for something like an election, it is true, you know, where there is just one spot, right? It is true that there are certain kinds of political um, sort of relationships or political actions that end up, I think, being co-op uh, competitive. Uh, like there's, um, but even there, you know, you can take more or less competitive or cooperative approaches to them. As we say, see the Lincoln Project right now uh, in their approaches to elections for at the federal level and even at the state level in ways they are, they are Republicans who are cooperating with Democrats over elections that have a winner take all approach because they have a certain political aim um, that, you know, in their view, I think the preservation of democracy that they're going for. And, you know, on the flip side, you sort of see Schumer right now saying, look, for voting rights, if you guys want to get involved with us Republicans, we'll talk about this and we're happy to cooperate. But if you are taking right now this, you know, competitive approach, so we'll compete like you know so I think what happens is that you have an aim and then you work your way through that aim and so it just seems like a weird thing to sort of put the form uh, before the questions about how you achieve it and then real and then also I guess I'm curious there are a bunch of things that we do politically um, I'm curious where they fit, like thinking about, say, uh, Senator Warnock when he was running for office, holding a puppy, right? Holding his puppy was actually pretty effective. Um, it was effective in the competition, uh, but I don't actually see it as a competitive mode. And sometimes you may actually hold puppies, you know, even if you're being cooperative, like because it, you know, makes people like you more and more likely to listen to you, right? And when you offer testimony, you might offer testimony because you're hoping to convince people and that might be cooperative, or maybe you're trying to convince people and then they'll vote for you more and that's competitive. So I'm, I'm just confused about this conceptual distinction, even though I like all the practical conclusions. So, I'm quite relieved that it works in practice, but I definitely want to hear from Dennis more of about how it might work in theory, which is really the center here. Go ahead, Dennis. Mira referred to it as my part of the paper, but I would uh, repeat again, not, I'm not trying to evade responsibility, but all three of us uh, participated in this. Uh, Jennifer and Min Lee set up a very nice uh, 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 contrast in a way Min uh, answered Jennifer uh, better than we could have, I think. We, we do say briefly, and more in the longer paper, 
uh, something along the lines that Min Lee was uh, suggesting, which is we do think that competition and cooperation are both necessary and desirable for helping uh, disadvantaged students and, and fixing the civic empowerment gap. Uh, now, Jennifer, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable worry that already our society is too competitive. Uh, and uh, we would like to see the um, competition taught in a way that, tame, not, that tames competition, it brings it closer to the kind of competition that uh, should be uh, pursued in politics rather than the kind that is sort of below the belt, dirty politics competition. And so we think it's important to capture for the purposes of civic education, the competitive agenda uh, and to try to make it better uh, than it would be just left on its own. We're not just encouraging competition for its own sake. So, uh, uh, Miera has uh, some subtle points here, but um, to avoid misunderstanding, we think of competition and cooperation as um, matters of degree. So it's not set up as a um, everything is either competitive or cooperative. There's some things that are more or less competitive and more or less cooperative. And so uh, you can have engage in that without necessarily um, saying you're in one rather than the other. But for pedagogical reasons, we thought that to be explicit about what you're teaching uh, at a particular time, it's important to keep these two things clear. Second, possible misunderstanding. This is not a comprehensive framework that covers exhaustively co everything that could happen in politics or in civic education. These are just two important dimensions that we think need to be emphasized and paid attention to. And in a particular way, the alteration framework and the reflective framework uh, are things that we think are distinctive about this approach that are not fully followed by the practical examples that we gave. We, we think they come close, but, but our framework would suggest as Seagal did when she was presenting it, some criticisms of those approaches. And uh, Mira may wanna say a little more. I, I didn't think that we were setting this up in, uh, in a way that um, uh, was against the idea of having a goal and then being competitive or uh, cooperative about it. I mean, the goal is civic education in this case. In politics, the goal may be uh, the common good or public interest. And you use competition or cooperation to achieve those goals. We're not saying anything. I think our framework, our conceptual framework doesn't uh, go against that, it's not inconsistent with that. I mean, I, I think maybe I would just add one word uh, to that, Dennis, which is to say that I think what Meira was alluding to is that normally in politics, whether it's simulated in the classroom or it's practiced in the public sphere, we have a certain aim such as, um, I don't know, passing an infrastructure bill or, you know, protecting voting rights. So we have a political goal that we are trying to advance and we're not setting ourselves up initially um, uh, as uh, deciding to make a move that would be cooperative or would be competitive, but rather we are just trying to promote our aim and uh, work through these different stances as, you know, as, uh, as permissible as, as possible and as is called for. And, and I think I agree with that as a matter of politics, but I think when you are learning to act uh, civically and politically, when you are learning the processes um, of doing so, uh, I think as 
Dennis was just now saying, um, uh, it's meaningful and it's useful to explicitly say, let us now turn and do, you know, use this particular structure, right? Let's um, move from this one to the next. Um, and especially, and just emphasizing, and obviously Mayra, as I'm sure most people in the audience know, Mayra um, has wrote extensively about uh, uh, the civic empowerment gap um, uh, and the differences uh, between the uh, opportunities that uh, students who are members of various minority uh, groups and minoritized groups um, to be able to participate civically in effective ways because of the uh, limitations of their training in school. We really feel that, or, or our assessment is that this approach can help underrepresented students. Um, it can help them learn how to compete and how to cooperate on the, on the basis of ideas that can support and promote um, their goals and shared goals, right? So obviously the goal of equal um, representation and equal participation is a shared goal. It's not a goal only just of those who are, uh, uh, whose voices are less loudly heard, um, but, um, uh, we assume that introducing competition and cooperation can really help um, uh, members of minority groups, ideological uh, and uh, identity minorities to be legitimized in their effort to win over others, to create coalitions and to win in competition or to learn how to express their uh, uh, perceptions and ideas, uh, perspectives, aims um, uh, in ways that are more effective. I thought that Mira was kind of working in the, in the liminal space in between the two horns, right? She's giving your account homework, and that is how do we teach uh, students how to code switch between these two mindsets, the actual art of, of, sort of improvising. But we actually have two questions that, are, that might help on that. We have uh, Eduardo Martinez and Stephen Winter. We'll take those in turn. Thank you for the really great talk. Uh, so I'm interested in one problem that contemporary polarization poses, which is a form of social sorting, such that certain lines of division, whether along identity or particular policy issues, tend to align. And citizens tend to find themselves reasoning about politics among like-minded others. So I'm wondering how, given your framework, students can learn to compete with some of the values you mentioned were important for competition, such as mutual respect, uh, and sometimes even collaborate with people that they perceive as their competitors, given that under the current conditions, their perceived competitors may not always be in the room, uh, or may not be there in great numbers or even their communities in great numbers. So the kind of negative forms of competition might be really heightened given that they're not gonna be internal to some of the activities you've proposed. Um, I guess that's me, I'm next. So, um, so I thank you for the paper. My question really tracks Mira's. Um, it seems to me that it's a, a false um, question to ask whether cooperation and, and competition are intention or interdependent or a matter of degree. Uh, it seems to me whatever you're doing, you need both sets of skills. And of course, teaching both sets of skills is great, but team sports already does that. Um, but that I think highlights the, 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 the nub of the problem, which I think is you're working within the wrong framing. Uh, the problem we face is one in which uh, of a, in a pluralist democracy, particularly one that's polarized, is that everything is a zero sum game. And what civic education needs to do I, I was muted somehow in the middle. I'm not sure what happened. So it, it seems to me that I'm, I'm sure, not sure what was heard, but it seems to me that there's a framing problem. It's not co cooperation versus competition. You need both in, 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 a, in, any, um, in any context. Um, it's the problem is we live in a society in which everything is a zero sum game and nothing is seen as a problem that needs to be solved through collective action. And what civic education needs to be doing is teaching the latter that we face problems that need to be solved through collective action. That collection action is gonna involve both skills of competition and collaboration but, and the virtues of competition and the virtues of collaboration. But uh, the framing seems to me is a false dichotomy that doesn't speak to the real issue here. Dennis, do you want to go first? Or yeah, uh, the uh, Martinez, the uh, social sorting um, and the importance of mutual respect, which we have emphasized, uh, 
how how can this be done in any classroom is not an easy question to answer. Uh, one of the things we've insisted on is inclusiveness and um, the um, include it, it, it these lessons both of competition and cooperation can be better taught in a, a diverse classroom we have in the longer paper some discussions of uh, the dilemma of how it comes forward in the um, in the question of whether the class should be diverse or not obviously we come down in favor of diversity but when that's not possible it's very important to bring in the perspectives of people who are not present. So there is, in fact, uh, uh, it's not an answer to, but it's uh, a strategy that would becomes more important the more the social sorting is prominent. Uh, I'm not sure whether that gets to what I thought was a very important uh, point and uh, problem. Um, the, on the wrong framing, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure um, you state it very boldly, but in fact, we, um, we do say that you need both. The, the one way of describing the aim of, of uh, a good democratic politics is to get a collective action for just a just society. And uh, in our view that one of the, th two of the things you need to do that is to learn how to compete properly and learn how to cooperate properly. And so I don't see that, uh, and I, you need both, but you need, to, our argument is pedagogically, you need to learn them separately and then put them together in a, as it's done in the legislative simulation. So I don't really think that your objection is goes as far as you think it does. And maybe just one more word on this letter point, which is that I think it aligns a little bit with what Jen Morton was talking about, which is that students are exposed to so much competition that maybe um, uh, it needs to be um, ameliorated or it needs to be corrected for somehow in our uh, educational efforts. And it seems to me that um, you know, in agreement with what Dennis was just now saying, that the um, introduction of um, uh, uh, introduction of collaborative or cooperative efforts uh, into uh, the uh, the practice itself and creating structures within the classroom where this is necessary can really help respond to some of the uh, polarizing. Um, winner takes all, et cetera, um, uh, uh, inclinations of the current age. But go ahead, Liz, you, you were uh, starting to speak. I, I wasn't, but, um, but thank you. Um, I just wanted to say we've got many more excellent questions than we have time for, um, sort of an embarrassment of riches. So we are going to try to group just um, two more sets of three together. So we're gonna to try to squeeze in six questions in our remaining time. We hope people will show up for the panels tomorrow and bring lingering or remaining questions there as well. Obviously we have a huge um, lineup of, of more papers and responses that are gonna be just as thought provoking. So hopefully people don't who don't get their questions in now We'll have a chance to ask them tomorrow. But for now, we're going to go with Mia Nazwicki. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Jay, who I think may be Jim Reed, and then Brandon Terry. Thank you, Mia Nagawicki, but very close. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your um, very engaging and provocative talk, Dennis and Seagal. Um, I was particularly drawn to your portion about the power of action civics. Uh, and that you're arguing that, in fact, this is quite an effective method and methodology for civic education. Um, but as I'm sure you both know, in many areas of the country, action civics has itself become a bad word. And um, in the context of our polarized politics, 
you know, the, the, these polarized politics have manifested in forbidding action civics in some schools um, in local and state law. So I wonder what each of you think about how we approach that. How can we support educators who are committed to providing high quality civic education that does, as you suggest, promote collaboration, cooperation and competition, um, but where they are fearful of, of approaching it in that manner. So uh, I, this is Jim Reed, should I go next? Okay, so thank you for your uh, interesting paper. Uh, do you believe it is productive in educating about democracy to point out that in political life, the alternative to rule bomb political competition is often violence. Ballots, uh, Abraham Lincoln phrased it, ballots are the only peaceful alternative to bullets. Competing through ballots is itself a form of cooperation compared to the alternative of resorting to violence. Uh, or do you believe it would be best for educational purposes not to refer to violence as a political strategy at all? Thank you. Um, thank you all uh, for the paper. Uh, this is Brandon Terry. Um, I thought it was really thought provoking and, and engaging. Uh, I think the question that I have has been asked in one way, but I, I want to try to put it a bit more pointedly, um, which is how much do you see the existing structural arrangement of American schools as an obstacle to practicing your model full stop? So. Um, it's not just about diversity in the classroom. It's the fact that across American schools, there's extreme sorting by wealth, race, and especially if you take private schools into consideration, probably political commitments themselves, uh, so that the private schools manifest part of the polarization we're talking about. Um, and so in that environment, I would think that almost any reliance on the existing school infrastructure would be self undermining because it's not going to teach the right kind of cooperation and competition to use your terms uh, across these axes of difference and, and and one of the ways I'm, I'm, I'm sort of seeing it manifest is that even when we're talking about uh, minorities in this model we're, we're primarily using a deficit language right that uh, they there's the civic empowerment gap they lack various things I mean on my reading of Mira's work, uh, she doesn't just emphasize the, the skill lack on behalf of poor and minority communities. It's also an emphasis about um, lack of knowledge and privileged communities. And so those echo chambers, I would think, would, would, would pose a pretty severe threat to the model. And since you guys are thinking really admirably about practical implementation, I just wanted to hear more about the extent to which you're, you're, you're thinking about other models than school-based civics education uh, to break through that morass. Can I try to take this on, Dennis, or do you wanna start? Uh, you can go ahead, that's fine. I, I have some thoughts on each of them, but uh, start with the action, action civics. Uh, the only thing I would say on action civics is that we make the problem worse for, um, Mia was said it's controversial. And one of our criticisms of action civics, uh, as it's practiced, not everywhere, but in a lot of places, is it's too apolitical. We want to make it more political. That would make it more controversial. And that would heighten uh, the problem that Mia uh, brings out very fairly, I think. Um, but maybe, Seagal, you have a way to deal with that. Well, I mean, one way, one thing that I would say is that action civics, along with social emotional learning, along with diversity and inclusion, along with uh, a, by now a list of 850 books, including books by and about um, um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, you know, are being banned left and right across district uh, around the country. Um, uh, 
And so I don't think we can practice civics in ways that uh, evade all of that, right? So I think um, uh, there is really a necessity of trying to, uh, as Mia was saying, support teachers and support um, districts, uh, practitioners in, um, uh, in uh, doing uh, their professional work. I don't think actually that what we are suggesting, you know, it makes it worse in one way that Dennis was just now uh, noting, but I don't think that it uh, is any worse than, you know, teaching about um, the civil rights laws or anything that is currently uh, being, um, being banned. And I think to Brandon's comment, I agree that definitely in this shorter version, it, uh, our approach sounded uh, as a focused more on deficits. And I regret that um, in the paper, we surely talk about the diverse ways in which people from different communities are engaged in formal and informal ways and how these two can complement each other uh, through uh, competitive and cooperative efforts, including across schools. We see a lot of that around climate action and other things that are forms of collaborative civic engagement uh, that, can, um, uh, that can support uh, uh, the kind of civic education that we have in mind. But I'm trying to be uh, quick here because I see there's another set of questions coming up, Eric. Final set of questions, and we, we thank everyone for their word economy, is uh, Abigail uh, Dim, Stephanie Thurston, uh, and Sanford Levinson. Let's start with Abigail. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> thank you both so much. Um, this will be quick, but something that I'm hearing from this presentation is, at least in my interpretation, is a lot about sort of a civic approach, a civic pedagogical approach. Um, and so I would just love to hear your thoughts on integrating this into other content areas, particularly given that um, to the previous questions, um, there's a whole barrier to getting more civics in schools. So as we're thinking about more civics in terms of content, how could we start now with existing content teaching these sort of what, how I'm envisioning these competencies around cooperation and competition? Stephanie. Hi, thanks both uh, for both of you. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how you understand the history of civic education, specifically in terms of the two concepts that you've laid out here. Um, I wasn't quite sure if you were sort of framing the paper as though at some point in history, cooperative strategies and norms were used to be taught, but now you're sort of advocating for both cooperative and competitive strategies and norms. So just a little bit more about the kind of historical claim um, or any recommended um, sources to better understand the historical development of civic education. And Sandy. Yeah, uh, thank you. This is really very, very interesting. Um, it does seem to me that the background assumption is negotiation about discrete issues, uh, whether it's infrastructure or abortion. But what interests me is a very old fashioned civics question which is teaching the way that structures themselves will shape uh, political activity. So that, for example, um, the fact that I detest Mitch McConnell does not lead me to say that he's not being thoroughly rational when he refuses to do anything that would be perceived as aiding first Barack Obama and now Joe Biden in winning re-election because we have a party structure with a winner take all presidency so that it is not in the interest of any Republican or one might say any Democrat to be a good sport if the consequence of that would be to enable the other team to win the next election. And is this something that could be integrated or ought to be integrated into a civics course? And how does it fit the two rich models that I think do work for issue bargaining, but not, I'm afraid, for you know, the kind of politics that we see right now in the Senate or indeed within the party system more generally? I take up Sandy's point, um, which 
uh, I think it's fair to say that the one background assumption is that we are talking about discrete policies. But um, as the example of the legislative simulation shows, uh, it's quite possible to talk about uh, and to teach about um, a kind of politic, maybe not Mitch McConnell, but uh, and your hangups with him, which I share. Uh, we can teach this, how structures uh, shape political positions. It doesn't have, there, there's nothing in the legislative simulation that ties it necessarily to specific policies, even though that's uh, the dominant mode. Uh, there's no reason that that model couldn't be used to talk about structures and how they shape uh, political outcomes. And uh, that, that relates to Abigail's point about content. Uh, what we see uh, in this is we've emphasized, as I said in my remarks, uh, my part of the paper, uh, this is a, an approach that's related to content, not content so much as attitudes and skills. And so it can be used for almost any kind of content, uh, perhaps not teaching violence as we heard in the previous round. Uh, uh, we would obviously not, uh, we would want to present that as an alternative that is to be avoided. But um, the, the, the approach, the, one of the values of this approach is that it's uh, not neutral with respect to content, but uh, inclusive as res with respect to various forms of content, including structural analysis and uh, inequalities of all sorts. Right, and and uh, just to add to that, I think it's really uh, important to remember in light of these questions that while uh, in response to Stephanie, we're not taking a particular stand on um, uh, the historical developments in civic education, but we do see, for example, uh, uh, history studies as one space where this can be Taught and in just a quick prelude, I think to some of the things that uh, Justin Driver is going to talk about tomorrow, it's also possible to think more broadly about the ways in which student speech is respected in various classrooms where different um, uh, content is being taught. Allowing for student voice to be uh, present in the classroom is really another way um, to support uh, the voicing of competitive ideas and the uh, practice of uh, building coalitions and um, practicing the habits of cooperation. Thank you so much, uh, Seagal, Dennis, uh, and indirectly Amy. Amy uh, will be enacting this paper in her uh, Senate hearing, no doubt, and beyond. Uh, and I should warn everyone that once you hear this paper, this dilemma has a deceptive simplicity and it gets stuck and you see it uh, in any discussion where democracy and education come up. So I really want to thank them for this paper and hand it to Steve, who will give you an uh, imprecation to come tomorrow. Yes, just to say uh, thank you all. Thanks to Dennis and Segal and the audience for fantastic questions. Uh, join us tomorrow at noon uh, for Shauna Schifrin's paper and the others to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you all.